Well, good morning. Uh, everyone here just looks wonderful. <laughs> um, I want, once again, I want to thank you all for coming. This is a really exciting uh, event for all of us. Uh, in case, uh, personally, I get to, to um, uh, meet up with some of the uh, core development team, which is, uh, really does help the project a lot. <laughs> Um, but I, I want to keep this short and sweet because I'm going to hear being talk. Uh, but thank you all for coming. Uh, I, I, I hope this uh, is an exciting two days for you guys. It certainly is for us. And, uh, and I'll talk to you a lot of you later on. Hi. My name is John Bruno. Um, I'm the co-founder of Case Technologies along with Laura Stigioani. And I, too, want to welcome all of you to uh, the third annual Strong Fest. Um, it's a great opportunity for uh, the developers to meet one another, as Gerald alluded to, and uh, to uh, think about new, new and more wonderful things for, for Wireshark. It's an opportunity for the users to get together and talk to one another, commiserate over the, over the, uh, the tool, and, in, and influence the developers, hopefully. And uh, also partake in it, what I think is an outstanding program that, uh, that so many people have contributed to that uh, I, I want to attend and, and listen to all of it. Uh, I also want to thank our uh, corporate sponsors uh, that actually helped make this all possible. And um, let's see, three special people, Lucia, who all you met getting registering, Sherry, I don't know if they're, I don't think they're here, I think they're still out working, uh, who, who uh, helped with so much of the logistics of putting something like this together, and Janice Spampanato, who's put her heart and soul into this. Thank you. I don't really have uh, uh, a lot to add besides the fact that uh, uh, it's nice to see that this is uh, uh, really becoming a family. Uh, we come back every year and our uh, faces are now are recognizable and are actually friends. And the other thing uh, is that, uh, uh, well, thanks to Janice, we also have uh, uh, a wonderful conference with uh, one wonderful speakers. And uh, uh, I'm really excited uh, uh, this year to be uh, sort of introducing uh, Van Jacobson was, uh, I was just telling him it's had such an impact on my life, but uh, uh, probably on everybody's life here. I don't know if, if you use BP, uh, BPF filters, so Walsh Architecture filters, uh, this is, uh, you know, the guy that invented them. <laughs> uh, so thanks uh, 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 from me for, uh, for coming too, and uh, uh, I really... Then I'm not saying anything. Bam, <laughs> at the time. It's about a block. 
and it didn't work very well. It was giving me a few bits per second. And I said, well, I'm a physicist. I can figure this out. Um, and it turned out to be quite hard. Uh, the biggest deal at the time, so this is 1985, and the problem was there were no network diagnostic tools. You guys hadn't come up with Wireshark yet. Um, and so what I did was, inside the Ethernet driver, I put a circular buffer, uh, and every time a packet went out, I put a timestamp and the packet went in that circular buffer, and every time the packet came in, I put a timestamp in the packet went in a different circular buffer. And then I used ADB to suck that buffer out of the kernel and plot it. And so this is what it looks like. Uh, and so the current dump was a shell script, and then um, graph. <coughs> so, uh, Wireshark has just got fabulous tools for looking at packet traces, right? You don't need to do it. It'll look at them for you and tell you everything is wrong. Uh, but you can only flag errors if you know what errors are, if you know where to look. And if you don't know where to look, you need something that shows you the data but doesn't show you a model of the data. Just tries to let the data tell its story. Uh, so my thesis advisor kept telling me as a grad student uh, that it, the world just has fabulous stories, millions and millions of fabulous stories, but it's an incredibly bad storyteller. It, it has so many things to say that it gets them all jumbled up. And Basically, your job as an experimentalist is to help it tell a story. You weave through all of these things and you try and pull out the threads of one of the stories that it's telling you. And to do that, you want something that's fairly model-free and can let you look at big pictures, can let you zoom in at details, can let you look at correspondences, and figure out. And um, I'm visual, so I want a tool that makes pictures and it's a real simple tool. You hand it numbers and it plots them. And you hand it one number and it plots them on the y-axis. You hand it two numbers and it plots one and the next one on the y. You hand it four numbers and keep the pair of bars. Right? So the world's simplest routing tool is inputs in ASCII. Um, I should put the other part of this up. Uh, and usually I find I'm measuring stuff. So that little funny triangle there is I planted my mouse on some data point, and I drag it over to another data point, and it gives me the distance in the x-axis and the distance in the y-axis, and how many data points, and then the slope. So the x-axis on this is, <coughs> I'm losing my voice, axis, axis is time, so that says, in between these two flights of packets, it was 35 seconds, which is grotesque. Um, eight, eight kilobytes. Uh, so it's a four kilobyte window, so it's two windows worth of packets. Um, and so kilobytes over seconds is kilobytes per second, so it's 0.247, 247 bytes per second. This is over the ARPANET, which is 56 kilobit lengths. Right? So we're using a tiny, tiny fraction of the bandwidth. Um, so, um, I'm putting up this tool because you know, here's a Swiss Army knife. It's almost as old as I am. It goes with me everywhere except airplanes. Um, <laughs> and graph goes with me everywhere. Right? It, it, any computer I've got, I'm trying to port it to my iPad now. Um, because it's a great way of doing quick looks at data. It's not too easy to see the data, so I'll have a better picture. Uh, so I printed that last picture up because it made no sense to me. And I carried it around for about a year. Um, this is what it looked like, the dots are packets, and there are these straight lines going up and then these long horizontal shelves where nothing is happening, and then they're usually introduced by little isolated packets. And I'm going, what the hell's going on here? I, am I losing interrupts? Is the driver stalling 30 seconds? There's nothing that's 30 seconds in the system except updates. So, 
Maybe it's file system activity that's kicking off the internet driver, making it go again. What, what's doing this? Um, now, I had to teach, so this kind of went on the shelf um, because I had to set up lectures for the next year. Uh, but next Christmas break, I got some time to go back to it. And I figured, um, you know, I had been staring at it and thinking of various hypotheses, and nothing made sense. It was the same in a couple of different machines. Didn't seem to be hardware. Um, so I replaced the little buffer with lens that was in the kernel with something that would match uh, a packet header, source and destination address, and ports, and snap the 40 bytes of TCP IP header into a circular buffer. And I'm doing this on a Sun 350, you know, which is a blazingly fast 15 megahertz, 68 or 20, with 4 meg of memory. It's not 4 meg of cache, that's 4 meg of memory. <laughs> um, and so, blowing a whole 40 bytes in the kernel for a circular buffer is scary. Um, but I put it in, and I got it working uh, about a week before Christmas of 86. And um, I wrote a little C program to suck it out of the kernel and print the headers. And uh, this is what it printed out. I, mean, I called the little C program TCP dump, because it would only handle TCP. I had this little filter it was just for TCP. Um, and I was going from a host called RTSG at Berkeley down to the machine I was teaching on, like Bernie at Berkeley. And there were my packets. I mean, cool. So that's all of the protocol headers. And now I can probably figure this out. And then um, I needed a picture because this doesn't speak to me. Uh, and I tried various pictures. And I finally got this one, where on the y-axis I'm plotting the sequence number from that trace. And on the x-axis it's time again. So the sequence number is the protocol doing its work. Right? It's delivered data. So what, if you advance sequence number, then the protocol's making forward progress. The slope of that line is user data sent divided by time. So it's the good put, it's the user data throughput. And this is saying you get a whole blast of packets Something happens, you delay for about two seconds, you get to send another one, and then you delay for 20 seconds, and you back up. The nice thing about sequence number is you can see it backing up. Uh, that's got to be a retransmit. It says that you lost something. And then if you see two packets on the same horizontal line, it means you're sending the same data twice, which is seriously stupid. So you can sort of see everything that's going on from this picture, and nothing is good. Just everything is bad here. We're sending the same packets multiple times. Every packet is sent about twice. Um, we're doing timeouts of 30 seconds now. 30 seconds was the maximum timeout in Berkeley Unix. It was clamped at 30 seconds. So our retransmit timer is walking up to the max and just sticking there. Uh, and what this picture should look like is a nice diagonal row of dots. And it should be packets that are smoothly going from the lower left to the upper right. And, you know, there's just nothing there that's right. Now, uh, I was so excited by this new tool that I was running it 24 hours a day for several days. And it didn't always look like this. There are some times that it almost worked. So, same post. I guessed you to earn the same link, went over the open net. And it's starting sort of the same way, but it smooths out. But then it fails, and it backs up, sends another burst, fails, retransmits, restarts, and then it runs for 26 seconds. It's incredible, you know, it's never done. Two seconds was the most it ever got. 26 seconds. <laughs> delivered 40 kilobytes of data, 10 windows worth of data, uh, and then it lost. But it restarted, it almost restarted again. 
So I go, it's capable of working. Right? There's something broken here. But it is like a car that you know, the engine almost catches, but then it dies. Right? It's, it's really close. Yeah. So what's happening? What, what's the difference between this picture that almost works and the other picture that just fails continuously in this part of it? Um, so I turned this out and carried it around for a couple of weeks. And early in January, figured out, hey, I've got 10 megabit Ethernet connected to a 56 kilobit ARPANET. And the Ethernet doesn't know about that 56 kilobits downstream. So I go to send my eight packets, you know, four kilobyte window, five kilobyte packets. I'm going to blast out eight back-to-back -back packets. They're going to go zipping away from my machine on this 10 meg Ethernet. They're going to hit the ARPANET gateway and they're going to crash into a wall because they're arriving way faster than it can send them. Right? And so that top picture, the vertical direction is bandwidth. You know, it's big pipe. You send your packets down. And then you're connecting a fat pipe into a skinny pipe. Horizontal direction is time. Now, bandwidth, bits per second times seconds is bits. Right? So that means that the area of every one of those boxes is the size of a packet. And if you scrunch it down in bandwidth, it's got to spread out in time because the number of bits don't change. So the packets hit the wall, and then they're dribbled into this little pipe and they spread out. And if you've got enough buffer at the wall to hold those eight packets, and as they go through, when they pop out the other end, they get spread out to be the right size to fit in the pipe. And once they're spread out, they're not going to go back together again. Right? They got moved apart in time. They're not going to push them back together. You hit the receiver, it turns the packet into an act. The acts come back, the receiver's just a mirror, right? Packet comes in, that goes out, packet comes in, that goes out. So the acts remember the spacing of the packets. Acts come back to the sender and they give it permission to send another packet, so it's like a mirror. Act comes in, packet goes out, comes in, packet goes out. So after a round of this, then everything is just going to run smooth as can be because the acts tell the sender when to send because the space of the axe is the space of the packets in the bottom of the link. And that's the lowest link. Said, cool. So the problem's got to be that we're not getting a full window's worth of packets through. Right? Eight is too big for the buffer. And so this thing can never start. So we blast a bunch of packets at the gateway. It doesn't have eight packets worth of free queue, so it drops one. Now we take a timeout of all those packets, all our good startup goes away, and we have to restart. But we can never restart because we're always turning on with this rush and there's not enough buffer. Now, prior to working on this, I've been working on part of the US uh, fusion reactor effort, uh, something called the Neutral Beam System Test Facility. Um, and they were trying to develop this device that puts power into a fusion plasma so that it will ignite and give you energy out. You know, energy from water, water is way better than energy from gas. Um, the neutral beam that we're using to inject power has a big honking power supply. It's a 10 megawatt device. It's basically a triode tube, uh, but it's a 10 megawatt triode running at 120 kilovolts. Now, if you turn on a 120 kilovolt, 10 megawatt power supply, then you get a big lightning bolt from any piece of copper wiring in the power supply to any piece of steel in the building because air ionizes at 60 kilovolts. Um, and 10 megawatts is enough to give you a really cool lightning strike. Right? Um, <laughs> so we, we have these big black melt marks all over the girders. And, the building where we're doing this. Um, so the only way that you can turn the sucker on is you put a big honking choke, a big inductor, 10 Henry inductor, um, in series with the line to slow it down because you have to flip the magnetic domains in the choke. 
and that makes the voltage come up slowly. And if it comes up slowly, then you don't ionize the air and you don't get the slight bolt. And so I had been working this thing, and I started a few times with the choke shorted, and it just a whack, 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 whack. You know, it's never going to turn on. It'll start to turn on, ionize Kroger off. And I'll keep doing that forever, minutes at a time, you know, until somebody hits the emergency off switch and starts yelling at me. <laughs> so I said, what's happening here is that same kind of turn on transient. Right? We're overloading the buffer. It's kind of like ionizing the air. And what we need to do is slow down the startup so that we don't put so much load on the buffer. Um, so by summer, I come up with uh, this two-line hack to TCP that made it start up slowly. And so it looked like that. And so this is the same path with that two-line hack to slow down the turn on. And there were some other things. The timers were fixed so they didn't go running off. It's um, a minor stuff, but the main thing was make it turn on slow enough. And yeah, this is pretty cool. Uh, now, in the process of getting from that ugly trace to the slow start, I looked at a whole bunch of packet traces. And so the two line fix wasn't the only thing that popped out. Um, so, one thing. <coughs> that you notice after about the 10,000th trace is it's boring. It's really, really boring. You're seeing the same. This is all the protocol information, but it's all the same. You're looking at this trace. There's only one number in the whole frigging thing that changes. You're getting all these packets, and there's only one number that ever changes. Um, and it's worse than that. So that one number, if you add the packet length to the sequence number, you know the sequence number of the next packet. Of course, obviously, it's a sequence number. Right? So they should be sequential. Um, and, but that's true for every packet. So not only is only one number changing, but you know what it's going to be before you even see the packet. There's no mystery here, uh, except for that last one was a retransmit. Um, so this was interesting in two ways. One is, I'm looking at these packets and going, I'm going to yawn. Um, but the kernel TCP implementation is going, new packet, wonderful. And it goes through it bit by bit. You know, 1,500 lines of C code to parse all the fields of this packet. They're just like the last packet. Yeah. Why do you think it's so new and wonderful? Um, so, because only one field's changing, and you know at the last packet what the next packet's going to be. Right? Internally, you can set up your packet state to say, here's what the next packet header is going to look like, because I know right, I got the last one. And when a packet comes in, what you do is compare its header to what you think it should be, and if it matches, you say, cool, I got the one I wanted. You take its data, you update your state, and wait for the next one. You can do that in 30 instructions. Right? It doesn't take a whole lot of code. So that turned into an algorithm that uh, was called header prediction, because the state is a prediction of the next header. And that let uh, this wonderful Sun 350 saturated 10 megabit Ethernet, which was widely believed to be impossible at that time. Um, the other thing you can get from this is, so we're doing Telnet over the IP network. It's a great thing if you get anywhere with it. But you type one character and 40 bytes worth of header plus one character go through your network. And so you know, factor 40 explosion of data on links that were at best 56 kilobits. So that's kind of painful. It would be nice to get rid of those headers. You've seen one, you've seen them all. Right? If they're all the same, they're really easy to compress. Just take the difference of two. Almost everything's going to be zero, so you can throw it away. And if you know the last one, you know the sequence number of the next one, so you can predict that. 
and you can turn those 40 byte headers down into one bit. That's pretty small. Right? You can put in the parity bit of ASCII in. Send your telnet characters in one byte. So that led to the TCP header compression RFC. Um, lastly, not in this part of it, but in this part of it, um, looking at the act stream. So we send a bunch of packets, and we see where Ernie comes back after 3585 and says, act 2049, cool, right? That opens the window a little bit, you can send four more packets. And then he says it again. Why are you saying act 2049? He's told me that. He does it again and again. Well, the, the spec for TCP says that if you get a packet that you can't accept because it's out of sequence, then you should send an act for the packet that would be in sequence for the packet that you expect. So what that act 2049 is saying is, I want 2049. And the second one is saying, I really want 2049, and you're not giving it to me. And then saying it again and again. And by about the third time, you know, you should believe it. You really want it. But instead, we're waiting for a timeout you know, 25 seconds later before we actually send 2049. Instead, by the time we got that third act, you know, the acts are being squeezed out by these additional packets that we sent after 2049. Uh, 2049 got lost. Some of the others are making it through. They're squeezing out the acts. But the acts are telling us what the far side needs. We don't need to wait for a timeout. We can just send it to it. So put in a few lines of code called pass retransmit that counted up the duplicate acts. When it's out of three, it said, I know what you want, and you send it to it and you don't have to wait for a timeout. That makes things be a lot more event-driven. Uh, I should have gone to that. Um, and the last one, I didn't have a slide for it, but so I got it working between LBL and Berkeley, uh, then tried a little bit further, tried going cross-country, and we had the time to live in IP set to 16, because it was a campus network. Um, and then in 87, NSF sprung for some transcontinental links, so we glued together some campus networks and we suddenly had an internet. But you couldn't get across that internet in 15 hops. It took 14 hops to get out of Berkeley. Uh, <laughs> so I get partly across the country and the packets would die. And so you would see in these traces a lot of ICMP unreachables. And I would, um, I knew Mike Carroll's would kill me. This is one I mean, the Berkeley Unix project. If I made the TTL too big, because packets were moving a lot in those days. Um, so I would bump it up by five and run it again. It would get a little bit further. Um, and I would keep doing that until it got to the far end. And somewhere along that, it occurred to me that, wait, I'm changing the TTL in these packets, and each time I do it, the packet gets a little bit further, and a different router sends me an ICMP. I'm tracing out the path that these packets are taking. I didn't know we could do that. <laughs> um, so I got so excited by that that um, I think that the light bulb went on after many, many weeks. Um, Friday night, about 6 o'clock, and I got the first version of Traceroute running Sunday night at 11 p.m. with no sleep in between, uh, but a whole lot of coffee. Um, and it was really cool, right? <laughs> Just ran it for days after that. Um, I, a little bit of history. So um, I, I'm pretending I had a big role in this, which is you know, total fault. Um, so, I had this really glued up kernel code to get the packets. Craig Blaris, who was uh, my group's sysadmin and Harvard guru and kernel hacker, jack of all trades, looked at the code and goes, oh, sickening. Uh, he picked it up. Uh, I, in order to look at a different set of traffic, I would ADB minus right came in, right? Because I had to install the filter in the driver and it was hard coded in the driver. And I'm kind of thumb fingered, so I would mistype the address and smash some random part of the kernel. 
and I would take down this file server that many people were using. Uh, and so Craig got kind of unhappy with that, and he put in an iOctal in the driver so that you could set the filter. Um, I had this TCP dump program to pull the stuff out of the driver. When Craig added the iOctal, he added protocol field so that we could pull out UDP, we could pull out ARP, we could start to pull out different things. Um, and we were having a lot of ARP storms at the time. And we were also having a lot of DNS problems. So I added, in addition to the TCP printer, an ARP printer and a DNS printer. And then Craig got excited. He added dozens of more printers to this TCP dump. Uh, and, and we had a guy named Chris Torek, who was a serious BSD guru, spent half his time in my group and half at CSRG in Berkeley. Um, and Craig and Chris sort of took this clue that was living in the Ethernet driver and they pulled it out, turned it into a kernel library that any driver could use for packet capture. Uh, and then they called it BPF, the Berkeley Packet Filter. It's an early version of BPF. And it didn't actually have the filter part in it. It just had this little transport signature. It only grabbed one stream of traffic. And that's uh, now to fix that, in 89, I was teaching the compilers course, the undergrad compilers course at Berkeley. Um, my best student in that class was a guy named Steve McCann. Um, and so I asked him, do you want a summer job? I said, sure. Uh, so I hired him to write a language to compile packet filters. Um, now the compiler's class, I wanted to teach it uh, so that students got a sense of the machine language and they didn't get that from assembler, so I had them compile into PostScript. So it was a, a C-like language, but it generated PostScript. Uh, and then later on, they had to optimize the PostScript, and it was cool because you could run your programs on your bitmap display and you can see cool figures and pictures and the like. Um, so Steve was pretty comfortable with the idea of virtual machines and we knew that for a general packet matcher we wanted an abstract machine, a machine that was specialized to packet matching, it had instructions for packet matching, but that you could efficiently interpret and see. It would turn into really fast C code. So the two of us Designing the language, that wasn't too hard. You just wanted to say the things you wanted to look at. Um, and then we designed the virtual machine. Uh, we knew it wanted to be a register machine, not a stack machine, because all the machines we had were register machines. Um, and it was a packet filter from CMU and Stanford. Uh, and it was really, really slow. It was based on a stack machine. So we knew we could do better than that. Uh, so. We laid out a first cut of the design. Steve implemented the compiler for it, compiled it into the machine description, then he wrote an optimizer for that machine description. Um, and he spent the whole summer on it, full time. It was great, it was a beautiful result. Uh, so Steve and Craig took that machine, packaged up all the lib PCAP, and they took the filter, the abstract machine and stuck it in the kernel in BPF, and at that point it was really BPF. Uh, and then Craig, who's very orderly and organized, pulled up all the things together and packaged them so that they could go out as release. Uh, I could I made the mistake of letting Steve write the code before he wrote the documentation. Uh, and so he wrote this fabulous optimizer, and he never wrote anything about it. And ever since 20 years now, most people look at it and go, beer <laughs> and magic. I'm not going to touch that. Uh, it's, it's actually not. <laughs> it's a fairly simple thing. Uh, so I'll say something about it here. Uh, it represents the filter as a control flow graph, which is either a linear set of nodes or a decision node where you can branch. There's no back edges, so you only go forward through it. You can't loop inside a BPF. And since you can't loop, it means that you can optimize it. If it had loops, you wouldn't be able to optimize it very well. Uh, so if you give that statement in the language, I want TCP port 20. Well, the semantics of that is the source port can be 20 or the destination port can be 20. The 
filter you get looks like this. It has to be an IP packet at the Ethernet level. At the IP level, it has to be a TCP packet. So that's what the filter says. And then if both of those are yes, you say, is it port 20? If so, you matched it. Otherwise, you say, well, is the desk port 20? If so, you've matched it. So that's the graph that you compile the filter into. And you see all the known branches of the filter saying reject. So if you extend that, you know, if you write another statement that says port 20 or port 21, so what the compiler does is compile the port 20 part, so we get that thing that we saw. And then it compiles the second part, so we get another copy that's identical, except the ports are changed from 20s to 21s. And it takes that second copy and it changes it to all the no branches of the first copy. So we start to match the first rule, and if we fail that match, since it's an or, we go and we try the second one. But this is clearly a stupid filter, right? because we check if it's ether type 20, and if it's no, we check if it's ether type IP. We check the same thing twice. Um, well, that's where the optimizer comes in. So you've got this representation. You, know, you look at the first term there, the ether type 800. The optimizer starts at the root. It walks down the graph, and it remembers what it's figured out so far. So um, when we take that no branch, the optimizer says, OK, I just tested that the ether type is not equal to 800. I know that's true because it's the only way I could be going down the no branch. Um, you get to the second expression, the optimizer looks at it and says, I just, I have a value for this expression. I know the answer, and the answer is no. It's not ether type 800 because the branch I'm on is the fail to find ether type 800. So what you do is say, I don't have to execute this expression. I know it's false. So I'm going to pick the outgoing no edge and stick it in that first no edge. So I remove the any second ether type check from the graph so by moving a pointer from the outgoing edge, one hop upstream. Uh, so I get rid of that note from the first test. Second test, ether type IP, if I was taking its no branch, up to the ether type 800, says, well, I already know that I've got ether type 800 because so I had to have that to get to TCP. Right? So I can take the yes branch and move it over there. Uh, so that node now points to the check TCP and says, but I know the answer to that. I know the answer to that is no. So we end up moving the fail edge, the no edge from that TCP over to that. And we keep going modifying this graph. We propagate what we know. Based on what we know, we modify the graph. We write it. And it's simple. You end up with this filter, which is what you would expect. This is the best you can do. And you don't have to be smart in the language. You can do just a dead simple language. You can add new constructs to the language. Hand it to the optimizer. And then we can walk through the graph and it cleans up all the mess, all the junk, all the duplicates. And you end up only testing what you need to test at the time that you need to test it. And it works for ands and ors and other things um, because of the restrictions that we made on the machine that it doesn't move. So that's the optimizer. Code might make more sense. Uh, hack it, right? It's, it's cool. We may have new things to it. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to leave. TCP, and I'm going to jump forward to about 2005. Uh, you know, there were a few other things that happened in that 15 years, but there isn't. Uh, so uh, this is some work that was done at Packet Design. And this is, so Packet Design is a company that Judy Estrin, Judy Estrin and I founded because uh, we were both really frustrated with network management. Uh, network management has been universally interpreted as router management, as box management. 
boxes aren't the network. IP is all about the fact that boxes are not the, are not the network. When a box fails, IP says, well, that one doesn't work, but that one does, so I'll go that way. Um, and you route around failures. What the boxes are doing doesn't matter. What makes a network is routing. And if you really wanted to do network management as opposed to box management, you would start with the routing, because that's what builds your network. Um, and routing changes are what tells you that the network has failed. Some component has been removed. So we made this company that was designed to do route analytics and route-based diagnostics. And you can do a lot of cool things if you know the routes. And it doesn't take much to know the routes, particularly the TCP. The Wireshark dissector for BGP tells you everything about BGP. You can just run the verbose trace out of T-Shark, pipe it into AUK, and pull out all the paths, find out where all the traffic is going. And this is not theory. This is, this is T-Shark BGP dissector piped into a big honk and honk program, um, together with some NetFlow data, trying to make sense of where traffic's going. Now, uh, the way that ISPs look at traffic today is to use NetFlow to compute traffic matrices. So this is Scenic, which is the California Education Network. It connects all the University of California campuses uh, all the uh, state college system and it's going down now to some of the K-12 system. For the universities, they get multi-gigabit links. I think they're actually 192. <coughs> probably going to 768s now. Uh, and so here we see some of the UC campuses and the Cal State University system. Uh, Scenic ties into four downstream ISPs at the time we did the state in 2005, level three, uh, Cogent, Quest, and Wiltel. And um, with the NetFlow data, they accumulate NetFlow where they peer with the ISPs. So on um, each of their peering points, they can measure the outgoing traffic, where it's going to, and measure the incoming traffic, who it's coming from, which ISP it's coming from, where it's going to. And so they make matrices that show a uh, percentage of traffic going everywhere. Now, uh, they buy some tools. They bought a tool from Keratin that makes this matrix from them. Uh, but this was actually put together using uh, a BGP trace and the same NetFlow data that Keratin was working on um, with this big on and script. Um, the observation, so again, I'm, I don't like tables and numbers. I want pictures. Uh, so these are point measurements. And you can only see where you're measuring. But if you know the routing, you can always convert a point measurement into a path measurement. So here I've got some NetFlow data saying maybe there's an Ethernet packet going from A to E at some time. And there's a little bitty packet going from B to F at that same time. Okay, so that's the kind of stuff we get in the NetFlow trace, and it's used for the traffic matrices. But if I know the routes, if I know that this was the distribution topology, then I can say, OK, that even if I could have to go A, C, D, E, so on each of those links, I can add the 1460 bytes of the packet. And the packet from B to F had to go B, C, D, F. So on each of those links, I can add the 256 bytes of the packet. So I'm accumulating the traffic from each of those flows on all the links that it traverses. Um, and in particular, you can see on the center link, the part that's shared, that the traffic is starting to add up. Well, extrapolate that to the internet, and you get this. So here's all of the UC campuses that were generating. So there's a cutoff if they were generating more than 1% of the total traffic, put a bubble down. Uh, they're going through scenic. Uh, wasn't using the will help period at all. It handled less than 1% of the traffic. They were splitting it off to uh, cogent level three request, with two thirds of it going to level three. 
But because we had the BGP data, so what, what BGP, if you look at a BGP update message, what it's got in it is the next column. So that's the IP address of the router you're going to send it to. And then it's got a list of ASs, which are clouds, and downstream ISPs, in the order that you're going to go through them. So um, you see this one. There was a scenic next top going to Quest, and then one going Sprint, and finally to SPC. And then finally at the end, there's the prefix that you're trying to reach. But you get a sequence of hops. They're not IP hops. They're ASs. They're clouds. Um, but they're the path that the traffic is going to take. That's the cloud. So you can, just like I showed in the previous picture, you can take the amount of traffic for each net flow record, and you know the route that it's going to follow. You know the BGP path. And you got that out of the BGP trace. So you amp that traffic to every hop. And you do that for all your hops. And then when you get to the end of the trace, so this is a tree. It's got to be a tree-like distribution which means that as you go down the tree, things branch. There's less traffic because of the branching. You see the most traffic near the root. You can see less and less as you go towards the edges. So you can start at the edges and prune back with some threshold. You say, okay, I don't want to see 1% or less. Right? I want to see where the bulk of my traffic is going. So you can lop off everything that's 1% or less of your traffic. And you're left with a fairly dense tree, which shows you where most of your traffic is. Okay. So, a, I don't know if you're afflicted with this disease, but you know, you're slinging a Perl program you know, late at night, and you add a little bit, you add a little bit, you add a little bit. Pretty soon you got 5,000 lines of Perl, and you go, oh my God, what have we done? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, this is an art program, it's a 300 line art program. It's Biggest one I've ever written. Um, and it was one of those moments, you know, stay up all night, you get it going, you go, oh God, <laughs> what have I done? Um, but it's pretty simple, right? You take a BGP trace, a net flow trace, BGP, you just apply it to the graph, you use box associative arrays so that you could keep track of all of the, the hops, because you, you just kind of guess hops that you're adding the traffic to. Um, and then when you get all done, you do the pruning, and then you feed the graph. You, I don't know if you're familiar with a package called GraphThis, which you feed it, node-to-node -node connections, um, and it gives you back a wonderful picture like this. Um, and so you basically feed it the raw data, which is the two connected nodes, the intensity of the attract between them is link weight, and it gives you back this picture. Um, and then the program spits it out. Uh, so if you have this picture, so this is identical to that traffic matrix that I showed you, except you can see beyond the downstream lines piece, and you can start to pull some other stuff out of it, like, uh, oh, that's really interesting. Uh, in particular, you can see that um, there's a whole lot of traffic to road runners, Comcast and SPC, which are all the home residential users. If you add that up, that's about a third of the total traffic, which says that a whole lot of people at the university are using either the university connections to get home or home to get to the university. And so we're going to see a whole bunch of traffic through the residential connections. Uh, another thing that you can see is pretty much the only reason to go to Quest is to go to Sprint, but we only go to Sprint so we can go to SPC because it's residential traffic we're trying to get to those DSL users. Now, that's a lot of hops for a residential user who's definitely interactive, right? They're working from home to their campus. And there's a lot of places where you can peer directly with SPC. And you can maybe save some money by going to Pix or an internet exchange. Um, and cut down those two ass hops uh, and the pairing costs. Uh, there are other things that you can sort. So that was looking at outbound traffic. Here's looking at inbound traffic. So we're measuring where scenic peers with cogents in level three. Uh, they 
appear with Cogent and Oakland, they appear with the book of Ruth in Silicon Valley. And now we've got the IGP routing, so we can actually see where the packets are going, make a map of our topology. Uh, and I'm looking at traffic that's going to Berkeley. Berkeley has two prefixes, 12832 and 12929. Um, and everything looks cool, right? Nicely balanced. Most of the traffic's coming from level three. We saw that in the period. Um, uh, but a third of it's coming from Koji. But uh, you can, so another thing that we got in the decades between 1990 and 2005 was a whole bunch of advances in web and graphics technology. We got SVG, which is really cool because you can make interactive graphics in your 300 line block. Um, and so what, um, take the dot file, massage it a little bit, it spits out an SVG file, and you can click on any of the links in it, and what you see is only traffic that's going to go across that link. So I click on that 128.32 link, and what I see is the only traffic that's going to 128.32 comes from level three. There's no traffic at all coming from Trojan for that prefix. That's Berkeley's main prefix. So anybody in the outside world trying to get to Berkeley, they have to go to level three. They can't use the Trojan unit for directly connecting to Trojan. And this was a configure on Trojan's part. They were focusing on physics and they shouldn't have been. Um, but there's no way to know. It's really hard to sort. Uh, so this is a full diagnostic. And it's relatively cheap. And it makes a lot of sense of NetFlow. It relates the flow data to your topology. Uh, but there's an issue with it, which is NetFlow, the volume is just staggering. If you put NetFlow on a gig ether, you're going to get a gigabyte an hour worth of NetFlow data. Um, and that's a lot of data to process. The problem is that the NetFlow representation is sort of stupid. Um, it's what you get in the NetFlow record is you know, source destination ports if you're looking at it, something that identifies the flow, and then a start time, a stop time, and an amount, or a start time duration. That's the same thing. Um, so that's a piecewise constant representation of the traffic. And the traffic is always changing, it's always going down and up. So NetFlow is going to approximate it by a set of stair steps. The reason you end up with a lot of NetFlow data is you want to track the changes, but you're doing it with these stair steps, so you've got to have a lot of steps. Otherwise, you don't match the data. So you make the NetFlow flow time up be really short so that the steps are relatively short and you get some resolution on the changes. Uh, and that's what blows the data volume up. But there's another way. Rather than using stair steps, why don't we use line segments? Because you can draw a line segment that's a pretty good approximation of anything that's changing. Um, and the particular line segments that you might want to use are a least squares approximation of the data. The reason you might want to use that is because least squares preserves volume. The area under a least squares line is exactly equal to the area under that NetFlow box, always. Which means that it will be bit for bit exact with the NetFlow measurements, but you can do it with far less numbers. Far less is um, packet design. We did this segment or in a traffic analysis project that we deployed at a bunch of ISPs. We deployed it at Google and a few other places. It pretty uniformly averages 16 bytes per hour to get good fidelity for a flow record. Um, and uh, let me show you what I mean by good fidelity. So uh, this is net flow data from Cdex peering pigs, which is a gig ether peering into an internet exchange, the Palo Alto Internet Exchange. Um, the raw net flow data, 14 million records, uh, they, this was the middle of the night, so they weren't saturated, only averaging about 100 gig. Uh, it's still 500 megabyte data overnight. So there you see the wavy lines, the raw net flow data. And then that blue line is the least square segmentation of it. 
So the segmentations, this cool algorithm developed by a guy at UC Irvine, uh, it starts by drawing a line between every two points, so it exactly represents the data. And then, it, of all those lines, it says, if I were to delete one point, which one point would cause the lowest error in the reconstruction? So, delete one point, now I turn two lines into one. And for all those one lines, I figured out the error, you know, which point I could throw away, which would give me the smallest error. And then it recursively do that, um, deleting one point at every step. And if you look at its progress, you get something where the error stays flat, 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 and it suddenly shoots up at some point. And you stop making lines where it shoots up. Usually stops if it's flat, right, you get down to one line. But if the data's got some spikes in it, uh, you end up with 10, 20 lines. Average is 16. The blue line is so 16. You can see it's pretty good fidelity to the data. It captured all the major events. It's right on the data, the blue line overlay. So it's not like a filtering or averaging. You don't lose any temporal resolution. I can really see what's happening there. Um, but you've got 10 million to one compression. Not a bad job smashing down the net. Um, and with that, I've been talking for a long time. I'm going to stop unless there are any questions. <laughs>
So you have to update for this new line what its error would be if you merged it. So you, you merge a line, you update stuff for the new line segments, the things that it connects to, push those on the heap, and then you just keep going, popping the smallest value. So you get something that's, um, you're always doing, you're making a bigger line, but it's always a bigger line that introduces the least error. It's the smallest distance from your data. And you keep doing that until you couldn't merge and make a bigger line. Any, any line that we merge on this is going to be real far away from the data. So we get a big error. Um, probably, uh, um, I point you at the references. There's a, a wonderful set of papers uh, by this guy, UC Irvine, who developed a technique for compressing electrocardiograms and electroencephalograms, waveform data that had anomalies, and you wanted to preserve the anomalies, exactly what their shape was and where they were, that you wanted to make the data a lot smaller. And he developed this technique um, for that kind of data, but it was beautifully for the application data. <coughs> We're constantly struggling with netflow data, just like you mentioned, and, and they constantly die because of the volume. Is this something that vendors are doing, um, or is this something that you're doing? Oh, what a nice question. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we did this at Packard Design. The algorithms, you know, public domain, it was actually funded by NIH research. Uh, I gave this work, gave it as a talk at NANAR. Uh, went to Cisco afterwards and said, you know, this is available and it's really cheap, but this computation that you could actually do in your ASICs because it's really simple to do. And Cisco said what they always said, which is, none of our customers are asking for that. <laughs> so we, we went at, um, Cisco prides it having done my time at Cisco. They, they pride themselves internally on being responsive to their customers, which means that you can't push technology into Cisco. Customers have to pull it out. But the way that Cisco's headed by a salesman and it's a sales organization, um, and the way that sales work is you get your customer to ask you for what you've got. So you build an empty <laughs> And then uh, you go out to a customer who says, I need to do voice over IP. And the salesman says, yes, you need MPLS. <laughs> but isn't voice over IP IP? Yes, but you need MPLS. And, um, and so if you've got that dynamic, right, a sales-driven company, but a reactive company, it's really hard to get technology in there because they're trying to steer their customers to trying to listen to their customers. Um, and it's, uh, there are several things that we tried to push into Cisco and uh, but I, there are other vendors in the world that, uh, that might be more interested. It's, it's simple technology, it's, it's public domain, uh, you can do it post-processing in an appliance, you can take the raw net flow data and you can crunch it. Um, because he was uh, doing this for EKG data, he was doing it online. Um, and the online version is you, um, as the data is coming in, you accumulate about twice as much as you need to segment. You segment half of it. Um, and then every time you get a new point, you add one new point, you merge one new point in the segmentation. Um, and because as you're building these segments, the error is building up because the data is going through many lines. Uh, preferentially, the new points that you add are the ones that get merged in, but they get merged into the right place. Uh, so a, that's a, a long, complicated way of saying you can be sucking net flow data out of the plants, gigabytes of data, into uh, a not huge buffer memory, and then spitting out these little tiny flow records out the end. Uh, it, it's a, an online algorithm, not just. Mr. Jacobson, I'm sorry. People could listen to you all day, I know. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have, we have 
the rest of the conference to get on to. So, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs>